we enter into worship with our call to worship. Jesus calls us to praise in prayer, to song and silence. Jesus calls us to worship. Jesus calls us to hearing and healing, to service and solidarity. Jesus calls us to love. Jesus calls us to advocacy and action, to protest and provision. Jesus calls us to justice. Jesus calls us as disciples. Let us heed the call of Christ. We are ready to serve the Lord. Let us worship together with joy. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In humility and faith, let us confess our sins to God. Savior Christ, we confess that we have heard you call us to repent of our sin, to believe the good news, and to celebrate the coming of your reign. Yet too often we do not listen to your call to discipleship. Too often we do not forsake old ways that keep us from following where Christ would send us. Too often we fail to live as those whose thoughts, words, and deeds proclaim the gospel to a world crying out for grace and compassion. Forgive us. Call us into repentance and call us by name, so we may turn our hearts to you. Hear the good news. Jesus calls us by name. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, by grace alone, you call us and accept us in your service. Help us to be faithful disciples that we might inspire others to follow in your ways. Strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of your call. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Welcome to worship and welcome home. Wherever you may be joining us with this, in this time of worship, again, we welcome you. And we pray that the, the light of Christ shine in, in your life in this epiphany season. I'm Pastor Tim Nabrat, and also leading worship this morning is Pastor Greg Wenhold. Later on in the, the service, we will be having Holy Communion, so we invite you now to have some bread, some wine, some grape juice on hand, and I will instruct you on how to partake later in the service. Once again, welcome home. <laughs> what are you laughing about? 
Oh my goodness. So I'm reading about this story about this dog at Dodger Stadium that ran off onto the field. Uh oh. That's and nobody crazy. could figure out how to get the dog off. And everybody was like screaming and yelling. You know, the poor dog was probably super scared. And then finally, the owner went up to third base and the dog heard, heard her and then went straight to her. Oh, that's awesome. The dog recognized her voice. Yes. You know what? Oh my gosh, that's so amazing that you said that. I'm reading in the book of Mark right now, Janitzi, and it's chapter 1, verses 21 through 28, and it's all about Jesus went to the synagogue to teach, and he's one that speaks with authority, and people were amazed, but it reminds me that just like that dog, when he heard his owner's voice and ran straight to him, Jesus speaks to our lives with authority and speaks to us, but we have to choose to listen to that voice. And when we choose to listen to that, God knows what's best for us. He knows us better than we do. So when we choose to listen to his voice and follow that, our lives, the chaos goes away and our lives fall into place. That's just, it's just like that story. We have to listen for God's yes. voice, just like the dog listened for his owner's voice. That's so awesome. Should we pray? Uh, yes. yes. Let's pray about that. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for speaking with authority to your people that you love. We pray that you will help calm our minds, slow us down in our busy lives so that we can hear your voice, that we can listen. We know that you know what's best for us better than, what, than we know what's best for us. Please help us to listen and focus on you so that we can live the life that you intended us to live. And all God's amazing, wonderful children said, Amen. The first reading is from Jonah chapter 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And then he cried out, Forty days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The second reading is from Psalm 62. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He, he alone, alone is my rock and my salvation, salvation my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock. My refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put, put, put no confidence, confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard him. The power belongs to God. And, and steadfast, steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay to all according to your work. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Holy Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Once again, I want to welcome you all to worship here at Resurrection Lutheran Church. Uh, we are located in beautiful Oro Valley and Saddlebrook, Arizona. It's good to be with you. In one of my previous congregations that I served as a pastor, I had this little group of guys that gathered every Monday morning at 8.30 for coffee and for donuts. We called it a men's Bible study, but I think that's being somewhat kind. You see, it was more of a Monday morning conversation about football, <laughs> about the Green Bay Packers, uh, about weather, and there were conversations around the local news of the day. I remember one of the men remarked once that the only real ground rule for the Monday morning guys group was that we couldn't talk about anything really important. <laughs> but every once in a while, we did. Something very important reached into our hearts at our Monday morning guys group and we would have a serious conversation about an issue that was near and dear to our hearts. And on those days, we defied our casual and frivolous reputation. We would discuss such issues as friendship or fatherhood. We would discuss being a husband or a co-worker. We would discuss doubt and faith. We would discuss death and dying and what heaven will be like. And then we would close with prayer. We would always close with prayer. Well, last Sunday, out of the blue, I received a Zoom request from this men's group to Zoom in with them the following day, the following morning. And so I did. I was so happy to hear that they were still meeting, and it was a wonderful reunion of sorts. I mean, I haven't talked or seen these guys for years now. Now, it should be noted that this group was made up of older men and younger men. It was made up of doctors and teachers, of construction workers and financial planners. And it was made up of both conservatives and liberals, both Republicans and Democrats. Well, at the end of our Zoom call last Monday morning, as I had done countless times previous, I asked the group, if there were any specific prayer concerns that we could pray about. In addition to the usual and expected topics, one fellow, in nearly a whisper of a voice, suggested that we should pray for the outgoing and incoming presidents. Now, I could tell that on this Zoom call, as I looked at everybody's faces, that this prayer request struck a nerve with a few of the other fellas. They were uncomfortable about doing this because, again, this was a politically di divided group. Some of them despised Trump, some of them despised Biden, and one, and one of our unwritten rules was never to talk about politics. <laughs> well, one of the guys asked him why we should do that. Why should we pray for them? I'll never forget his response. He said again in a whispered voice, because I don't know anybody else who is doing that. 
And I thought to myself, isn't that the truth? That we often pray about and for those we love or those we want God to bless. But we seldom pray grace upon those whom we dislike or even despise. Now I ask you to keep that statement in mind as I share the words for today, my words for today. We seldom pray grace upon those whom we dislike. As you recall, Pastor Greg shared a message last Sunday that looked at the Old Testament story of Hannah and her miracle son, Samuel. He talked about Samuel's calling from God and how Samuel responds, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And then Pastor Greg talked about identity and how our ultimate identity is in Christ Jesus. You and I are, are children of God. This is our, our true identity, an identity that gives us meaning and purpose and life. Well, today we look at another Old Testament character, a man whose name was Jonah. Scripture tells us that God called out to Jonah and said to him, I want you, Jonah, to bring a warning to the people of Nineveh. And Jonah considered God's request for about a nanosecond and then replied, absolutely not, God. Those are my enemies. I despise the people of Nineveh with a deep hatred. Rather than preach them, why don't you just take them all out? Why don't you just kill them all and the world would be done with them? <laughs> so there are no doubts that Jonah didn't like the people of Nineveh. And though his words may sound harsh, there was good reason for Jonah to despise them. You see, the people of Nineveh were a corrupt and godless people. They, they hated God. They took advantage of the poor and the powerless. They were vicious at war. And as a culture, they publicly supported witchcraft and idolatry and prostitution. There was no way that Jonah was going to bring God's warning to a people like that. And so, what does Scripture tell us that he did? He ran away. Jonah ran away and he hid as a stowaway on a ship that was transporting freight from Joppa to Tarshish. And he forgot all about God's call upon his life. But God <laughs> never forgot about Jonah. And through a series of actions, Jonah was thrown overboard into the sea, swallowed by a huge fish, and finally barfed out, right, onto the shore. And that is where our first lesson for today, from Jonah, the third chapter, picks up the story. For the second time, God calls out to Jonah to go to Nineveh and warn the people there. And this time, Jonah actually goes. He walks the 500 miles or so to get there, and then he begins walking through this huge city of Nineveh, warning the people that the wrath of God would come upon them, them if they didn't change their ways. Forty days, Jonah cried out. You've got 40 days to change. Now, it was supposed to be a three-day mission for Jonah. But in just one day, Scripture tells us, a miracle happened. The people actually listened and they changed their lives from the greatest of them to the least of them. They repented of their sins and they bowed down to God. And God changed his mind about destroying Nineveh. <laughs> Mission accomplished, right? Wrong. <laughs> because Jonah, Jonah, it says, was furious with God. These were his enemies, remember? He didn't want God to forgive them. He wanted God to destroy them. Jonah even goes so far as to level this complaint against God. You know, I knew that you were going to do this, God. I knew you were going to change your mind and forgive the people of their sins because I know you are a gracious God, slow to become angry, full of mercy and love. 
You know, when you consider the story of Jonah, most of us get wrapped up in the part about him being swallowed up by a huge fish and being in the belly of that fish for three days, right? That's what we know about Jonah. The book of Jonah is four chapters long, and only three verses speak about Jonah and this big fish. And that is what, yet, what most of us people know about this book. And I'm not saying that it didn't happen. I'm just saying that if we get sidetracked with the fish story, we lose sight of what the message of Jonah is truly all about. See, the people of Nineveh, Nineveh were sinful people. There's no disagreements about that. But when God called Jonah to bring a word of hope to them, Jonah refused. Jonah disobeyed God. And now Jonah was the one filled with sin. <laughs> Isn't it curious that Jonah could be so acutely aware of Nineveh's sin and yet so blatantly blind to his own? <laughs> Jesus once made a remark about that, didn't he? You point out the speck in your neighbor's eye, but you fail to see the log in your own. What Jesus said and what Jonah did proves that religious people are often masters of pride and deceit too. You know, we think we're better than the sinners around us, but deep in our hearts we know that we're just like them. True for Jonah and yes, true for us. The second thing to be gleaned from this familiar story is that life in the world today is, is not so different from life in early Nineveh. I told you that there were godless and idolatrous people, but look around, right? Look inside. We have lots of idols too. We might not call them God, but we call them names like success, popularity, beauty, intelligence, power. And all the world agrees that these qualities are to be sought out, to be valued, to be revered. These are the gods of present-day Nineveh. In Jonah's day, it was sinful to take advantage of the poor and powerless. And I'm sure glad that we don't do that in this age. <laughs> Never mind that this month, this month, some 29 million adults in this country reported that their household sometimes or often didn't have enough food to eat in the last seven days. 29 million. And around us, here in Arizona, 14% of adults reported that their household didn't have enough to eat. Never mind that 10% of the population in this country lives below the poverty line, and we are the richest country on earth. Never mind that during this great pandemic and economic shutdown, so many workers have lost their job while higher-ups continue to thrive. Never mind that even today, men, women, children, the elderly are used and abused in unknown numbers. The poor and the powerless are everywhere. But it's sometimes too painful to notice them. And so we don't. You know, the Jews have a saying that goes like this, I cannot rejoice as long as there is still one person who is weeping. And regarding war, what can we say about war and disputes between nations? What can we say about how polarized and divided our nation is today? Jonah hated Nineveh because the Jews had a history of conflict with Assyria where Nineveh was located. And you and I know that hitting, right, has always been a human response to hatred. It starts in the sandbox. It starts out there on the, on the playground when one child hits another and then that child hits back harder. Philip Yancey, in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, says that this behavior continues to escalate until one side is willing to not hit back. It continues until one side is willing to say, that's enough. 
Now, if that concept sounds foreign to you, imagine how it sounded to poor Jonah. God was calling him to enter the land of his bitter enemy and bring them a word of grace. No wonder Jonah didn't want to go. But God sent him anyway. Finally, I wonder if the message of Jonah's story is also that every single one of us is called by God to go to some sort of Nineveh. And we're fighting against it. We don't want to go. You know, our, our Nineveh might be a place, a job change to a distant city, and you don't want to go. You know, just this past month, we had some dear members of this very church move to Texas for a, a job opportunity. And I'm not sure if they wanted to go or not. They uprooted their entire family, which included two high schoolers. But I know that they felt called to go. And so they did. They went. You know, our Nineveh might not be a place. It might be people. Perhaps there are neighbors who moved in or coworkers that you just, you know are concerned about, you just don't know about. And they don't seem like the type of people that you want to associate with. Maybe they're people of different race, different faith, people who have obviously different lifestyles than your own, and you're simply not going to go over there with a plate of cookies and be the welcome wagon to those Ninevites. <laughs> but friends, let me ask you, what if the huge fish swallows you? What if your life turns on a dime and you take a difficult and bumpy turn and you are desperate and those Ninevites come to you? Or our Nineveh. Our Nineveh might not be a place or a people. Our Nineveh might be an idea, a way of thinking. God might be calling you to open up your mind, to change your position on something controversial. You think of yourself as principled, right? But maybe you're just as stubborn as Jonah. Even when you think that God might be nudging you into a new direction, you can't give up the old, right? You hold on to it. You can't abandon your very righteous ship. To do so would be to align with the enemy, right? The Ninevites. You know, it might be your position on politics or a whole multitude of other controversial and hot topic items, and you simply cannot change. You think you hold a position on these issues, but just maybe the position is holding you. Or maybe Nineveh is a personal habit, some secret sin that has crept into your life, and while you sense God is calling you from it, you don't want to change. You know, friends, Nineveh is not a distant land in a distant time. It's in the world that we live in today. And I believe that God is calling the church, God is calling you and me to be 21st century Jonas. We can bring a word of hope to those who don't know that there is a God, a God who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. A God who is merciful and full of grace. You know, we can start with those who are nearest to us, our family members, our friends. We can start with our church. Caring for them, praying for them, sharing kindness with them. That's what God asked Jonah to do. And through scriptures, we see that an entire nation was changed because of it. You know, what I said at the beginning of this sermon, I now say at the end. You know, we seldom pray grace upon those we dislike. But God, God has called us to pray especially for them. You know, I, I believe that my Monday morning friend was prophetic when he asked us to pray for Donald Trump and for Joe Biden. Because that's what God asked Jonah to do, right? I mean, hey, Nineveh. God loves you. And friends, that's a message that we're also called to live out. Let's pray. Lord, help us to pray grace upon those 
whom we dislike, as we hope and trust that they pray grace upon us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God, what do you believe to be true? I believe believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For the church throughout the world, for pastors and teachers, deacons, deaconesses, musicians and servers, that all proclaim the good news of God's reconciling love, let us pray. Have Have mercy, mercy, O God. For skies and sea, for birds and fish, for favorable weather and clean water, and for the well-being of creation, that God raise up advocates and scientists to guide our care of the earth. Let us pray. Have Have mercy, mercy, O God. God. For those who provide leadership in our cities, and around the world for nonprofit and non governmental organizations, for planning commissions, homeless advocates, that God inspire all people in the just use of wealth. Let us pray. Have, Have mercy, mercy God. God. For those who are sick, distressed, or grieving, for the outcast, and all who await relief, especially those we mention in our hearts right now. Right. 
that in the midst of suffering, may God's peace and mercy surround them. Let us pray. Have Have mercy, O God. For our congregation and our communities, for families big and small, and for the organizations that meet, May God's steadfast love serve as a model for all relationships. Let us pray. Have Have mercy, O God. In thanksgiving for our ancestors in the faith, whose lives serve as an example of gospel living, and they point us to the salvation through Christ, let us pray. Have Have mercy. mercy. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift lift them them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is is right right to give give God thanks and praise. The night in which our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of of me. Again, after supper, he took a cup. He gave thanks. He gave it for all to drink. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you, for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Each time you drink it, remember me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom. And teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As you have uh, hopefully had time to bring to this moment your bread and wine or grape juice, right now as you take and eat the bread, this is the body of Christ. It is given for you. And take the wine or grape juice that you have, and as you drink it, this is the blood of Christ, which is shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, may it strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. 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 Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Amen. Hey, it's Pastor Tim, and these are the announcements for the week of January 24th. It's not too late to sign up if you are looking for a new church home or you just want to learn more about Resurrection Lutheran Church. Come and join us on Sunday, January 31st at 12 o'clock noon out on our covered patio. Lunch will be served and you can sign up through Christina Randolph in our church office. The 2021 offering envelopes are available to be picked up in the church office for those who traditionally give through these envelopes. If you would like to call first, we can have your envelope ready when you arrive. Or you can see Christina Randolph on Sunday mornings at in-person worship. Mark your calendars for Saturday, January 30th. All are welcome to come join us for the amazing race, RLC style. Discover Oro Valley and have fun. Prizes will be awarded. You can see Brenda O'Connor or Janinsi Spencer for more information. Once again, have a wonderful week and go Packers. And now may God the Creator strengthen you, Jesus the Beloved fill you, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter keep you in peace. Amen. Amen.
We join together, called by God's Spirit, we are to be the presence of Christ in our daily lives so that others will follow him. Go in peace, be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God.